New books from Our Daddy in November. The Magic Corridor, American Jesus and Prodigy. Coming in January, ne- Nemenis Reloaded. It looks so nasty. Art by Jorge Jimenez. Before that is Nightclub in December by Mark Miller and Juanan Ramirez. Do you think comics are too expensive? So do we. Every issue, just one ninety nine. Hey folks, uh, back here for another Miller time. John Romita Jr., probably the most legendary artist working in the industry just now. And I don't think it can be disputed that Johnny's like the number one guy. The funny thing about Johnny is if you set a bunch of artists together at, in a pub or, you know, at a convention, they all have their favourites and there's always guys they kind of hate and there's guys they think they're overrated. There's probably what maybe two guys who everybody says is brilliant, like just from a creative point of view and as a person, everybody likes Johnny. But from a creative point of view, he's unparalleled, you know, and he's, he's somehow maintained this for, a, for a, a great long career. The other guy, Frank Quietly, you know, there's people like this, you know, that everybody says, you know, absolutely top of their game and everything. But, but Johnny has done it now, it's crazy, for like six decades, you know, and is still one of the most sought after guys. So actually having him today, I know he, he never breaks away from that drum board unless he's doing a signing. So getting him to come and talk is brilliant. So Johnny, fantastic to see you. It's beautiful to be seen. Six decades? You know what? You're right, because I was three years old when I started. (laughs) Do you know the funny thing? I actually, I discovered you before anybody in America, I think. And I don't know if I've ever told you this, you know, but 1978, you were doing stuff in maybe 76, 77 at Marvel. You were doing a lot of promotional stuff for Marvel UK and everything, you know, and you drew the cover of an annual, and it was a Spider-Man annual that I got for my Christmas when I was seven years old, right? And here, not to make you feel old, because I'm kind of old, you know. But but I actually I discovered your stuff before it, and I sat and copied your art and everything, not realizing obviously thirty years later we'd be pals and working together and everything. But you've, you know, you've been in, you've been there for a while, you know. Yeah, I started uh, in my second, right after my second year of college. I yeah. sent samples up to Marvel, never expecting to get a job, and they gave me a little bit of work. Still wishing to finish those last two years of college. But uh, if all goes well, I'll be able to buy a college. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> but it's amazing, I mean, because you, you look back, most people have got a 10, 20 year career, you know, uh, or even 10 years if you're an artist where you're at the top of your game. But, but I think you're one of those guys, it's a bit like Mel Gibson, you know, who, you know, excellent, who everybody loved, and then suddenly went to another level, like up again. You know, we can come to all this, you know, but I think you, you constantly reinvent yourself, which I think is so interesting. Like you're never lazy. You always rethink what you're doing and take yourself. You push yourself, don't you, all the time? I push myself because of a, ma- a, a, a name you mentioned a few moments ago. It's quietly. Guys like him, even though he's probably a couple of years younger than me, as long as there are people like that. Yeah. And then before me are the generations that are the brilliant artists, the Ramita Seniors and the Kirby's and the Buscemi's. Yeah. But my contemporaries and people like quietly, you can't just sit back on your ass and think you're great when there are people that, are always making you look like this. So yeah. it's like going to a, a great gallery or a museum as yeah. an artist, thinking you're great. You walk in and you look at, oh my God, I am just a minuscule piece of nothing <laughs> compared to these brilliant artists. There's always something, and my father told me this, there's always somebody better than you somewhere. Yeah. Smarter, yeah. better, better look. Well, not better looking, but anyway. <laughs> So just get used to the fact there's always somebody better than you and it will do two things. It'll straighten you out or it'll make you collapse because then if you think you're that great, yeah, you're never going to get any better. And if my old man and Buscema and Kirby didn't have egos, how could how the hell can I have an ego? That's crazy. I mean, I'm so fascinated. I mean, we've been friends for 20 years, but I'm so fascinated by the idea that, you know, your dad is a legend, obviously. You know, everybody loves your dad. But even his social circle, you know, are like gods to us, aren't they? I mean, they're like the Mount Rushmore, you know. Like, and I, I've never asked you this, although we've been friends for years. Like, did those guys ever hang out at your house? You know, did you ever have Kirby coming up and John Basima and those guys? Because yeah. were they all East Coast guys when you were you were a kid? Were they a drive away Correct. from the Ramita house? Yeah. I would I would come back from school and one of them would be in the living room. Uh, but it's Kirby, uh, uh, Joe Simon, oh my uh, whose grandson I was just hanging out with in Dubai. Right. Uh, yeah. Jesse Simon. Uh, 
Joe Simon, uh, Stan Lee, and all of those guys. And before I was cognizant of who they were, yeah. they were just hanging around, having a glass of wine and talking. And Kirby with his big cigar, Buscema. Yeah. Uh, and the advice that they would give me didn't make any sense when I was a kid. Yeah. Because I was such a young artist. But Kirby's ultimate advice to me, because I was a slower artist than he, well, everybody was slower than Kirby. Yeah. With his cigar, take it out of his mouth. Is, Throw away your effing eraser, kid. <laughs> I love that. Said, if you're correcting yourself, you're not going to get better. You should go with your first instinct. And that's how he said he got fast. Yeah. And Buscema nodded his head and said, that's correct. You just don't go with, don't think you're going to get better as you erase and try to change. Go with your first instinct. May or may not be true, but I laughed until I cried laughing about that. You know, there's, there's something in that. It's like actors on their first take, there's a kind of energy, isn't there? Artists, the layouts. I've seen guys whose layouts are so much better than the finished pencils because they second guess themselves and they tighten up. You know, I, that's Very what. True. That's a guy who's been in the industry 40 years, isn't it? Kirby in the 70s telling you this by that point. Yeah. And, uh, the funny part was that it, it, it's not always true. Yeah. But when you first rough it out, you're right. It's got a more spontaneous and exciting kinetic feel to it. Yeah. And if you over. If you go overboard, you will lose that kinetic energy. That's yeah. very, very true. Very accurate. Good point. And those guys were saying that without using the word using the word kinetic because they couldn't they couldn't spell that word. But they didn't, <laughs> it didn't matter. You're exactly right. Go with that first energy. And when we did all our stuff together, I was lucky enough to get that kinetic feel into it without much erasing because it plays itself out. Yeah, it's the truth. It's it funny because. Out. I mean, you're probably the only person I know who would know those guys outside of a convention, like like your dad right. and everybody, you know, all, all, what were they like? What, what were these guys like? Because to us, they were names on a page or maybe little photos you saw in fanzines. What, were they warm were they, guys? Were they, were they friendly guys? You know? Yeah, very. They were very friendly. But there was that little bit of uh, old school looking at me and, hey, kid, how are you? How are you, Junior? You know, because <laughs> I was son of John Romita. Yeah. But they were never nasty or disrespectful. And the only one with an ego, which was yeah. not a malicious ego, was Stan, Stan right. Lee. Yeah. He was confident and he accepted all of his praise without distributing it to his artists. Yes. He would yeah. accept it as if he had created everything himself, but not in a malicious way. He was just very proud of what he did. Yes. Yeah. When it yeah. became the point that Kirby's family said, wait a minute, Jack Kirby did 75% of the work, created the Marvel Universe. And... Stan basically nodded and said, yeah, that makes a good point. Then everything changed. Right. And the artists of that generation visually created the Marvel Universe. Yes. Yeah. But it's funny. I mean, it, I mean, a writer's always going to say this, but I, the, they're like Lennon and McCartney that they both excelled when they were together, weren't they? I mean, Stan without Jack was diminished, but Jack without Stan was also diminished. Like New Gods is genius but it's not Fantastic Four genius. It doesn't have that warmth that the Fantastic Four had. It was all about the ideas instead of the personalities, you know? So put the two of them together though, and that's an unbeatable force, isn't it? It's a great analogy. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the funny part was the, the stories that come from Stan's people about how much he actually gave to Jack Kirby and John Romita and John Buscema vary depending on who or how much they were drinking at the time. <laughs> uh, there were times that we heard Jack would say, uh, Stan would say to Jack, uh, I got a character called the Silver Surfer, knock yourself out. Right. Boom. Yeah. We have Galactus. This is the God, quote unquote, the capital G God of the Marvel Universe. Boom. Jack Kirby blew it out of the water. Yeah. Same thing with my father and the Spider-Man universe. Same thing with John Buscema and his universes. Their, their imaginations were allowed to run wild with one or two words. And then again, Stan would give them an in-depth description of what he had in mind sometimes okay. listen we did the same thing you would give me an idea sometimes it was a, a two-page description or sometimes it was one sentence either way it was enough to run with and then yeah. we would change on the fly yeah kick-ass wasn't kick-ass first it was big daddy and hit girl first that's right for two years, for two years. that's right and then you threw in kick-ass and everything blew up it's it's a change on the fly and as long as egos never get in the way I know how great I am compared to you. <laughs> but I think that's where you do need a partner who brings out the best in you. Like I like there's guys I work with who elevate me and you're one of those guys who elevates me, you know, like like Frank Quitely's another one, you know, Brian Hitch is another one, you know, the, just really excellent guys 
But it's a bit like casting a movie, isn't it? Just because two people are good, it doesn't always work together. But you and I together, we felt it on Wolverine, didn't we? When we did Wolverine Enemy of the State. It was there was a nice synergy there, and and I couldn't wait to work with you again. I was so excited. I knew we were going to do something, but I didn't know what it was, was going to be. The connection between a writer and an artist is always immediate. With yeah. us, it was immediate. Now, the good thing about that is that we can go from the, the get start at the get go and build. Where some guys take six months, six issues, a year before they can start feeling their oats together. Yeah, you and I hit it, hit the ground running, and yeah. I felt it immediately because you gave me a plot and dialogue and the dialogue would be for expressions alone and it was varying depending on what i sent you back yes yeah. it was a great uh camaraderie is all i can uh, put it and i'm sure that with stan and jack and stan and ramita senior there had to be the same kind of camaraderie has to be otherwise that work would never be as successful as it is yeah yeah no i think you're right you know and people that make you push yourself and try harder as well you know like it's that metal against metal thing, isn't it? You know, you need you need somebody that's going to make you actually try, isn't it? You know, course, you never could. Anybody before me, or my, again, I, I say it, my contemporaries, and I know what Jim Lee and Frank Miller did or doing, and then McFarlane comes along with his quirky style. Mm -hmm. As long as there are people like that around you, yeah. if you don't have a heart, you're mm -hmm. not going to get better. If you have a heart, you want to get as good as the Joneses. Yeah. There's no other way of putting it. I've always got competition that I admire or emulate or want to beat. If yes. you know, excuse the expression. I want to show people I'm better than them, even if it's not malicious. Yes. Well, that's healthy, isn't it? You know, I mean, Rob Liefeld and I talked a couple of weeks ago and we were saying it's a bit like football teams and everything as well, where a bunch of great yeah. players emerge at any one time, but they all inspire each other to be better. It's like Top Gun, isn't it? You know, that you, when you're in that elite, you will try your best. It's no coincidence those image guys all broken at the same time. It's true. And if you have at any point as an artist or a performer or an athlete, if you think yeah. you're great, you're not going to improve. Yeah. If you think you're, you have the possibility of greatness, you will get there someday. Yeah. And I'm still working on that. I got a long time to go. <laughs> I live, when I live to be 200 years old, I'll be, I'll be a great artist. <laughs> and do you know what age were you when you realized that your dad and your mum, your mum Virginia obviously was working at Marvel as well, you know, like two Marvel staffers. We kind of public profiles even then, you know, Johnny, you know, was a big deal. He was kind of known in the college campuses and everything. He was drawing Spider-Man. At what point did you realize they were cool and kind of different from everybody else's parents? Oh, uh, I don't know exactly if there was a period of time, but it, it was an adjustment that I had to make because mm -hmm. they were no different. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't remember how long it took, but it was nice as I got closer to the industry, then you realize that they were great in, in their art and in their creativity. Mm -hmm. But to meet them personally, it, it wasn't as many visits that I could judge that by yeah. uh, as much as it was my reaction from my father's reaction. Yeah. When he would tell me how good a guy this guy was, or I get along, I get a phone call, I, get, I talk to Stan. And Stan treated us well. He just was mm -hmm. this higher up, than everybody else. And you get that feeling that he knows he's great or he's a little bit standoffish, but then he would smile and say, hey kid, how are you? Good to see yeah. you. Because he was yeah, writing two things. He was, he was kind of people's bosses too, because he was on the business side. So did, did you feel Stan kept himself away from the creators a little bit then? Did, yes. did, did he shield he himself did. a little from everyone? Yeah, He did, but it wasn't, again, I didn't get any feeling of malice from him in any way, shape or form. It was, it was a little bit of superiority as a creator. Yeah. And as yeah. the boss of the company that was all about creativity, yeah. he was above everybody and he would demand higher up, a higher level uh, uh, production. Yeah. There's no other two ways about it. And I wasn't the kind of guy you could go down to a local pub and have a beer with. He yeah. wasn't that way. But, it's, but he was brilliant as a creator. It's funny, one of, one of my relatives, he's got a building company and he was saying whenever he was starting out, the guy who was the foreman, you know, the guy in charge of the company, used to stand 10 feet from everybody else and have his lunch on his own and not speak to the guys, even though he, he loved them, he got on well. But he said, look, I have to do this because sometimes I'm going to say something you don't like because I have to make those difficult decisions. Do you think that was kind of it with Stan that he had the business in his head? As, you know, That's got to be a universal thing because yeah. uh, Jim Shooter was that way as well as the editor-in-chief. Yeah, uh, He and I didn't get along personally when he was the editor-in-chief. Now we're yeah. friends. Mm -hmm. uh, his, without saying those words verbatim, he pretty much said, I got, I have to be your boss. I can't be your friend. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. I, I suppose that that's universal. You have to. And if you're not, then you're people are going to take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. So now listen, I had, I had a mother as a traffic manager. <laughs> and I'll give you I'll give you a microcosm through an anecdote. Yeah. She calls up on a Monday, and I had a head cold and a hangover. I had pages due that day. Yeah. Eight pages. I was that close to getting them done. Didn't work on Sunday, so I got a call Monday morning from Virginia Romita, the traffic manager. Manager, she says. <laughs> You owe me eight pages. You're supposed to be in the office right now with those eight pages. This is your traffic manager. Where are my effing pages? <laughs> but, oh, my, I don't know. Not, I said, I got a head cold, and I'm, uh, you know, I didn't tell her I was hung up. I got a head cold, and I, I, I promise I'll get them to you by tomorrow. You better, be, you better be in this office and your ass and in this seat to show me. She hangs up the phone. Five seconds later, hello, this is your mother. Are you okay? <laughs> You sound terrible. Are you all right? <laughs> Quote, unquote, true story. But she demanded, and that's the way you had to be. You had to demand. And that's, you couldn't be a friend. You had to be a boss. Your mom sounds like a Batman villain. That's amazing. Like, phone back and apologize. <laughs> I got another one for you real quick to give you the impression of what this woman was like. My <laughs> foot tall Sicilian woman. A buddy of mine sublets my apartment. Yeah. $500 a month at the time. He's late. He couldn't pay his bills. He had a rough time. Four, two, uh, four payments go by without money. So he owes me $2,000. And I know the guy for a million years. Yeah. I tell my mother the story just casually because it's not a huge deal. Louis okay. He's a good guy. All right, all right. I leave the house after the visit. I get a call the next day from Louis. He says, Johnny, you think by threatening my life, I'm going to pay you any <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you talking about? He says, your mother just threatened to cut off my testicles if I don't pay the bill. Uh, a week later, I got a check. <laughs> that is another true story. That is the kind of woman that Virginia Ramita is. That's, that's why Marvel books always shipped on time, you know? But that's <laughs> true story. The, the, the Virginia schedule is what it was called. But it's funny because you must have... Um... I mean, you must have felt like Marvel was your home from home, you know, like your mom and dad are both working up there, you know. The idea of working anywhere else must have been unthinkable back in those days. You know, that's where you were you were going, wasn't it? There was something to that, yes. But yeah. it was because we grew up before I started working there. I yeah. grew up around the characters. My father worked at home. Yeah, yeah. When we could, well, when I couldn't sleep, the monsters were under my bed. I'd go up and sit at my father's feet while he's drawing comic books like adam and, and andy with joe Cuber, the same thing like same thing yeah exactly yeah. right there's something about it and it becomes part of you spider-man became a sibling yeah uh daredevil became the, our next door neighbor that it, it just <laughs> felt warmth and my brother didn't take to it he's all brains and i'm only an artist yeah but i took to it because it was different and i i didn't feel like i had to be better than my friends per se in sports yeah. I was there with something that was unique to me. Yeah. And it really, it helped my adolescence. Listen, I went to grade school and middle school and high school and I got better as an artist. I did something better than all of my contemporaries. I wasn't as decent an athlete as I was an artist. Yes. I was a decent student, but I was a good artist. I was a yeah. decent athlete, but I was a very good artist. There's something to that with adolescence, absolutely. Yeah. And did your dad <clears throat> encourage it in you? Was it because I know sometimes the people working in the arts they're scared of their kid coming in because it's a tough life, you know, it can be a tough gig. Was your dad protective or was he encouraging or what? What, what was the the vibe? He was, wasn't protective. He was coldly uh, 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 logical. He right. said, first of all, and I told you this a few minutes ago, there's always somebody better than you somewhere. Yeah. Don't get so full of yourself. And you're not going to be a cartoonist. I want you to be an artist. If you want to be an artist, you'd be an artist, not a cartoonist. Yeah. Because you got to go through school. You got to go through this. I want to see you get this degree. I want you. I, then I will see. But he never volunteered information. He only answered my queries. Right. If I said, Dad, I have trouble with this, he says, then get this reference, go to a bookstore, get that photograph, and work from there. Mm -hmm. Cold. He was Mr. Spock about art. <laughs> you do it. And he said to my mother, I heard the story years later, that he was concerned I was going to be heartbroken because there's yeah. always somebody better. Get used yes. to it. Yeah. yeah. And he, funny, ironically, the best artist I ever met was up in the attic doing his art. Yeah. And what, your dad came from a commercial background, didn't he, before the romance comics and everything? Your dad's... Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, he did. He went to a commercial art school, correct. Because, uh, I mean, that's a hard-nosed world, yes, isn't it? You know, so... And many of his contemporaries work uh, were... Uh, business they worked in 
advertising. Absolutely yeah. true. Yeah. But it's, it's fascinating to me, you know, because I, I find what I do with the children, I've got three kids and I, I show them all my favorite artists. I read them my favorite stories and everything. You know, did your dad ever put you on to the Alex Raymonds of the world and everything? Did he ever show you this stuff to sort of encourage you? The guys he grew up with? He didn't direct us toward, didn't direct me towards it. It was yeah. around, it was ever present. He didn't want me to feel that I had to do anything that he was doing. Right. But the, the references, the Alex Totes, the Raymonds, yeah. uh, the, the Gibsons of illustration, they were thick books lining our uh, the, the walls of our house. Yeah. And we would go to museums and he would show me J.C. Leyendecker illustrations and Norman Rockwell illustrations, yeah. uh, which while they made me feel this small, it made me want to get that big. Yes, and that that is a family thing. You don't you don't feel sorry for yourself. Listen, he's a man from the depression. Yes, where you had to work your ass off just to feed the three other mouths in your family. There's no adulation. You yeah. get the money on the on the on the, the front on the, the table, yeah. and uh, you let us eat. There's no ego, so I could not possibly let that affect me, especially seeing all these brilliant illustrators lying lying around in his office. Uh, it was a stark reality. And he, for a man that didn't have an ego, he says he couldn't be as great as those. And yet he reached heights that they didn't. Everything's relative. And I felt strong about it to get better. I didn't feel sorry for myself ever. And there's, there's something so Shakespearean and so brilliant about he being, you know, a previous generation Spider-Man artist who when people think of Spider-Man, they think of Johnny Senior. And you're this generation Spider-Man artist that when people think of Spider-Man, it's your drawing. I mean, there's something beautiful in a world of the 8 billion people. The two best Spider-Man artists are called Romita. Is weird, uh, isn't uh, it? Listen, there's, uh, uh, there's always somebody that I would like to show <laughs> that I'm better than without, yeah. better than, without being on a personal level. Uh, but that's a competition thing in me. And I still have the fire. I want yeah. to show that I am better. But it, I don't know about the Spider-Man thing because there's so many other issues. Listen, I've been doing it. Spider-Man, I've done about 20 years out of the 45 years I've been in the business. Yeah, yeah. But there's always somebody who has lays a claim to it. There's the McFarlands and there's the Bagleys and uh, uh, all these brilliant Spider-Man artists before, well, around the time that I've been doing it that can lay claim to having a big impact on the Spider-Man universe. My reality is that I, I followed great, great artists and it gave me incentive. Yeah. But I have a great art, a great Spider-Man artist before me that I emulated. Unfortunately, by the time it got out my fingers, it was still mine. It yeah. sucked. <laughs> but he was always encouraging, but he wasn't demanding. And he yeah. answered my questions. I like that, what you said. I appreciate what you said. And over the, the period of time that I've been doing it, yeah, I do have a nice uh, connection to the character. I don't know if it'll ever reach for me to senior because Marvel, think about it, their merchandising was hinged on his yeah. artwork. Oh, every kite, every toy, everything. It was always Johnny's art on the side. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely true. And I see mine occasionally, but uh, I, I, everything's relative. Like, like I said, I can't, I can't get too full of myself when there's great people. Again, it makes me want to work harder, and I love every bit about that. But it's funny, when I look at your art, I mean, I don't know how objective you are with your own stuff because you're so close to it, but that idea of, like, I look at Adam and Andy and I can see their dad's DNA and their, their work, Joe Kubert, but you, you've got so many influences, like, uh, you know, the, Kirby seems a, a big influence in your work, you know, like, do you recognize that, that, you, that there's a weird masculine power to your artwork, you know, that is, is guys being pummeled, they're not just being punched, they're being pummeled, going through dirt, you know, their faces all mashed up and everything, you know. You've got yeah. a real Jack Kirby action vibe to your stuff, you know? That is from reading his stuff as a kid and also yeah. asking the opinion from my father about what what is it about this? Yeah. What makes this great? And he would say, and actually he didn't say the words that got me to square off my my figures, my, yeah. my blocky uh, <laughs> time, was Jack Kirby it said, you want to make these characters look three-dimensional. So you give him this edge and you give him this edge and you give him this edge. I went a little too far and got it blocky. But yes, the power came from reading Kirby books. The elegance came from looking at my father's work and Buscema's work. The, the education I got in grade school and in higher education about brilliant illustrators yeah. adds to that. The design sense. Uh, uh, there's also so many things about storytelling that came yeah. 
from watching film with my father. Yeah. We would listen. There was no there was no internet when I was a kid, so we would stay home on the weekends if it was rainy instead of playing uh, baseball. He would take yeah. us out and play baseball. One of the great things he ever taught me was how to hit a curveball. Yeah. And yet at the same time, he would show me about drawing and I would talk about the drawing, but the storytelling, watching film together, yeah. uh, 12 Angry Men uh, 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 on the waterfront, which were just film noir. And yet they would talk and he would explain what's coming next. Look at this image over here. Now look how he's talking this way over here. You turn the camera and you can see you're still in the same room and look at the angle, look at the design. It was an education every time we watched the film. And then to come into comics and need that, only translating it into stop action film in comic book panels, it coalesced into a storytelling ability that made my artwork better. That's amazing. It's, it's funny, I spoke to an old artist years ago who said that working in comics kind of ruins the hobby for you because you dissect everything. You can't help but dissect everything you're watching. But in a weird way, I think it actually elevates everything, doesn't it? Because you really appreciate things that you might have just let go over your head, don't you? You, you, real, you look at every decision, don't you? It is. It's, if you have any storytelling sense, yeah. you can become an editor in chief, well, not an editor in chief, but a, an, an editor on a film in a minute yeah. when you can break off these beautiful images. I'll give you an example. The movie called The Big Country, mm -hmm. Charlton Heston and Gregory Peck. Unimportant what the story's about. The film was called The Big Country, and there were scenes where there was a fight between these two egos. These two guys are fighting each other, and the director pulls back, and suddenly you have this gigantic 70-millimeter vista mm -hmm. of the big country, but you could still hear the fight going on. Yeah. That, to me, was a microcosm of storytelling. You don't need to have everybody up close and cheap yeah. with some of these type imagery. Yes, I do scrutinize almost every film I watch because I know what a good storytelling is. However, you can't argue with directors and editors. They can do it. And acting uh, and special effects technology. Think about what it was 50 years ago as compared to now, yeah. all relying on good storytelling. And that's where I learned it from. And my father told me about it. And comics just was spot on with it. And I had to do stop action film. Did the Gregory Peck... Charlton Heston fight, stay in long shot for the fight. No, they, were... they, they came in and out. Right, right. I was going to say that... was the initial pullback yeah. to show the big country. You yeah. had muffled punches, and my father says to me, "What, what, what's good about this?" I said, "That's a lot of grass." <laughs> he says, "That's right. You show the size of the country. That's why the yeah. movie's called the big country." And it made sense. Holy shit, you didn't have to come in close with a punch yeah. and show blood spatter. Yeah. You could show the big country. And think about it. How many times where you'll ask, uh, there, there's a room full of people. And you could start off with a close-up of two people talking. And then three or four panels or a page later, show the inside of the room. Yeah. So it doesn't always have to be the immediate uh, establishment shot. Yeah, but there is an establishment shot in it. So two people talking, and you pan back, and you're in a courtroom. Yes. Holy crap! There's a courtroom, and there's people, and there's the guard, and there's the judge. Yeah. That's storytelling. That's so interesting. It's funny because I, I love a surprise long shot of something supernatural, especially you know something like Brian Hitch when he was doing the Authority with Warren Ellis. I remember he had some close-ups of a character jumping around rooftops, which we've seen a million times before, and he pulls back for one panel. And the characters are dot, but you're like, oh my God, this guy's up 600 feet, you know? And there's something about playing with that, you know, we've seen that a million times, but it's a fresh take, isn't it? Every, uh, listen, I don't know if, unless you need a, a, a true great cinematographer, I think every artist in comics that can tell a story worth a damn can be a director. I don't care what yes. anybody says. Yeah. You get a, a cinematographer that will whisper in an ear about some technology. All you have to do is lay out a, a comic book. Do a, storyboards yes yeah i think we could be directors i really do i don't know if i could do it unless i had a great uh, cinematographer with cinematographer with me yeah i think i could eventually but i'm not a kid anymore yeah so we'll see I gotta bribe some people i'm sicilian i could do it <laughs> i don't know if uh, i ever told you do you know tony scott the director said you were an amazing storyteller like he, I didn't know that. I, I don't know if know I told that. you this, no? Because because no. he, I that's when I found out he actually uh, sat and did his own thumbnails for how he wanted it to look. He did his own storyboards. Like he drew wow. everything. He was at art school for eight years, 
he did, he did two, oh he's an amazing artist. He did two degrees in art, you know. So, so he loved he loved comic books. He didn't read them religiously the way you know we do and everything, you know. But he would dip into the greats, you know, and see John Buscema, guys like yourself, all that kind of stuff. Right, know? right. That's I didn't know that. That's what a compliment. My God. But listen, I've got to ask. Whenever you come into Marvel, then you know to go back to mid seventies. I was talking to Jerry Conway a couple of weeks back, you know, and it's, you know, you you literally came in probably at the maddest period in the company's history. Like 1977, you've got editors in chief changing all the time. And did it feel unstable or did it feel exciting? Did it feel like it was coming to an end or did it feel like there was potential? No, I wasn't conscious of it. I was too yeah. too nervous at, uh, yeah. about trying to get work. Yeah. Uh, because I was given a little bit of work that made me not want to go back to school. And then suddenly... Uh, you're only as good as what you just finished. And if yeah. you don't do it right, you're not going to get any more work. Any more work. Yeah. It's simple. And then the bills would start coming in. Yeah. Uh, it was intimidating, but self-intimidation. I, I brought it upon myself. Uh, it was there in front of you. And if you could do the work, you'll get paid. And that's ultimately where that depression era work ethic came from in me, yeah. Yeah. watching my father. And who was EIC when you came in? Who was the boss? Uh... Stan was. So, still Stan, really? Stan was at the time the editor-in-chief, right. but he was also the publisher. And right. as far as I know, the next one underneath him as the editor-in-chief, I don't remember exactly who became the editor-in-chief. Uh, I don't want to say the wrong name. I don't know. So uh, you, you were just working with your editor then? You know, you were really... The, the immediate the editor. editor with me, yes. And who was but, that? Uh, who did you have? <laughs> believe it or not, Larry Lever, Stan's brother. No way, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he was the editor-in-chief of the British department. And right. That's when I right. first stepped my foot into it. Then yeah. it was Archie Goodwin. Right, right. Do you and know, Archie Goodwin, and he's the one that gave me a chance to do a regular monthly title. I can say this because my kids aren't in for another half hour. They're still at school. But you were... Partly involved in me not believing in Santa Claus anymore because of this 1978 annual. So 1977, summer 1977, a guy in my class said to me, you know, Santa's is not real. And I was like, of course he's real. You know, we get the presents every Christmas. And he said, go in that, go have a look around the house when it gets close to Christmas and you're going to find the toys that show up on Christmas morning. And I was like, no way, you know, but I, I did. And I remember opening up this cupboard door in my brother's room and I saw the Spider-Man annual 1978 and oh. there, John, Johnny Ramita Hart crushing all my dreams, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't know that little story. Gee, now I feel like oh my God. But like, you know, it's funny. I would say the greatest misconception in the world is that having a famous dad makes life easy for you. Because I, I bet, we've never talked about this, but I bet it was tougher for you coming in as an artist because one, you're being compared to your dad. There must have been guys who also said, oh, he's only in the job because of his dad and all that. You know, did you have to deal with all that crap? Was, yes. And what yes. happened? What, what, what kind of... I, can, I can put it into one small lecture from my father. Because of my history, my friends and my history of being oh. rowdy kind of guys. Oh, Johnny, but, sorry. I think we, we could maybe edit this in a second, but I think yes. it's somebody signing out from another device here. I'm just, I think we still I, seem I to be a government. I don't see anything. That we're good. It still seems, is it still recording on your end, yeah? Yes, it is. Yes, cool. still great. recording. So if we could just start that one again, that's great. But as, as a youth, a rambunctious youth going out with friends, we were not known to be gentle souls. <laughs> and uh, my father knew. He, he, you know, We were athletes, but we were also a little bit unstable. And he said to me, concerning what you just brought up about people commenting, he said, keep your hands in your pockets, keep your mouth shut, and do your effing work. Mm -hmm. That's how you get back at these morons. Yeah. Now, I, I made a joke once that if I, if I punched everybody that deserved to be punched back in that day, I'd still yeah. be in jail. <laughs> I got treated like dog shit, excuse the expression, but it wasn't uh, enough. It, it didn't take it. I didn't take it to heart. Yeah. I could see what they were doing. They didn't like me because of my father's last name and my last name. Hmm. And it made me work harder to shut them all up. Yeah. Uh, that didn't bother me as much as the higher ups sometimes doing things I didn't care for. Mm -hmm. And one in particular, I won't mention his name, at a meeting with my mother there as a traffic manager said, yeah. don't give him this. He's a little too full of himself, quote, unquote. Wow. Now that was, that was biting because it was a higher up who could control yeah. my income. Yeah. Fortunately, after I was on my way out the door, 
under my own volition. I was ready to quit because yeah. I didn't get a chance to do something because of that person. I was approached by another editor who said, you know what, before you go, why don't you think about working on Daredevil? Yeah. And Senti and you would be great. And you get to work with Al Williamson. He's ready to work with you. Mm -hmm. Complete left turn from yeah. where I was with the frustration of being held back due to my last name. Yeah. This one editor named Ralph Macchio gave me a chance and it completely allowed me to be free again, if you'll excuse the expression. And that made me a better artist by far. I got to work with Al Williamson. That's amazing. I, I mean, what, what was and it like? Daredevil, like but inked by Al Williamson? I mean, did, did, he, did he make any, was he a gentle anchor? What type of anchor was he? You know, was, he says he's just tracing. He was a sweetheart. Right. Yeah, I, I knew what he was like before he worked for Marvel. I, I, yeah. I, we oh, grew up on his stuff as an illustrator. Yeah, He was a brilliant illustrator and it made him a brilliant ink artist. Yeah. He said he was just tracing my stuff. Of course, he's full of shit, but <laughs> it was an, what an honor to hear that from a, an esteemed artist. Oh. He and I worked out along famously. We worked well together. Anna Senti was a brilliant, is still a brilliant writer and a great lady. And we got along famously. Completely disparate politically. Yeah. It always was a good story yes and al williamson made everything look better and that suddenly gave me bona fides yeah. beyond what i had been doing previously in spider-man and the x-men and the good part was i got a chance to work on man without fear with frank miller yeah which might be the from uh from word one to word last the best thing i've ever done as a compilation of books because i had al williamson making me look great it was uh, uh, it was brilliant. Loved it was it was all three of you though. I mean, all three of you were just firing at all cylinders. It was just you know sometimes there's a beautiful moment where everybody's good. You know, it's it's, it's great. But I remember. I mean, that was what 91, 92 or something. Man, right, the early nineties. When your your and the Senti run on Daredevil was that eighty six? That same period of time, Frank yeah. saw the Frank. I called Frank and asked him to work on a Wolverine uh, uh, graphic novel. Yeah, and he says, "No, I like what you're doing on Daredevil. How about if I show you something?" And he sent me. A, a, a treatment for a film right. concerning Daredevil that got rejected. He said, I'd like to turn this into, a, into a, a graphic novel. What do you think? I read it, loved every second of it. And it was for 64 pages and I'm on page 50 and he says, I have an addendum. And he sent me an addendum that ended up being 88 pages of, of additional material. Wow. And it became that gigantic graphic novel in three parts. I uh, never knew that, so that started life. That started life as a movie? I, I, I hadn't realized that. started out as a film that was not accepted, correct. And who, who, who was putting it together? Do you know who the producer was? If, if he told me, I have forgotten, but I forgot who yeah. it was. He was so angry, but he loved it. Yeah. And it, yeah. was, it was year one. It was Man Without Fear year one. And you, you must have seen okay. as well, you know, the Daredevil TV show. I mean, it owed so much to that book as well, didn't it? Exactly All the slick right. stuff and yeah, everything. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. The producer and director Johnson said to that effect, he says, that graphic novel series gave me the incentive to do certain things. And the the imagery, some of the, we got, I got comments from him. He would send me emails. Yeah. He was a nice guy, Mark, Mark Stephen Johnson. Nice guy. He was a good guy. Very nice but, guy. But even, even the Stephen the Knight series, I think, you know, owes a lot, the Netflix series, owes a lot Correct. to the stuff you and Frank were doing as well. But it's funny because, I mean, that's what fascinates me about you. That was the first time I saw you go through a shift. And most artists get lazy. I mean, this is a terrible thing to say. Most writers do as well. You know, they kind of, they rely on a bag of tricks sometimes, you know, as, as, as the, in the industry 10 plus years. But you did something crazy. It was like you swallowed some pill or something and, and you took yourself up to a different level. Were you awake? Was it, was it working with somebody else who was also pushing himself that did it? Do you think the fact you and Frank are, are working no. together or do you think you were on that curve already? What, what happened? I had a chip on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I was angry at everybody because right. of the way I got treated yeah. by that editor. Uh, it, instead of putting my head between my legs and crying yeah. like a little little bitch. Yeah. Sorry, I get, I get angry when I think about it because <laughs> I see this person at conventions. Right, yeah. Uh, instead of getting angry and not doing anything about it, I did something about it. I wanted yeah. to show everybody and shut everybody up. Yeah. And the more I did and the more Frank liked it, the more the, editors liked, the editor liked it, and Ascenti uh, wanted to work on the book again yeah. because of what was coming out of that graphic novel. And it was yeah. almost less so artistically as it was storytelling. Mm -hmm. I had so much fun with the Kingpin in that. Loved every yeah. second of it. We had the Kingpin yeah. as the, it was the, it was the Godfather. He was the yeah. bad mafia yeah. done. Yeah. Uh, th there was so much in that that I loved doing. Frank gave me so much room to play. 
Right. And that was a great character. And that's that's what it was, which is why working with you was much akin to that, because you just would let me run. And then the dialogue would be adju adjusted to the artwork. You gave me latitude with the storytelling. There's more to that than just an ego. I know what I like to do. And when yeah. you send me something, even if it's a snippet of a conversation, I can give you expressions. Yes. I can give you body uh, 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 body motions in the room because of a conversation, a simple text. That's when a writer knows what he's doing and says, give me this. As long as you give me this editorially, give me three pages of melodrama or three pages of action. Just as long as we get from point A to point Z, have fun in between. That's There's not many people I can do that with though, because it's it's hard if you're, if you're not with somebody who's really good and also understands what they're doing. It can be like doing a jigsaw, it can be a mess. So I'm, I'm normally quite tyrannical. I'm like, no, 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 stick to the script. But you you would, like an action scene, you know, you would take to another level, you know, like you'd even cut to the other side of a door and do something interesting, like the, the blades coming through the door in the hit girl scene, which wasn't in the original script. It was from the other side in the script, you know? So you would also, you'd, but you would also give your, your ideas about something that would spur a larger uh, uh, imagery. That's because you have a visual creativity. Uh, some writers that don't just know what they want to convey story-wise. You have a visual sense too. Frank has a visual, Frank was an artist. Mm. John Byrne was an artist. John Byrne yeah. did the same thing with me. He'd say, knock yourself out. Just make sure you get from point A to point Z. Yeah. But you had that sense with the kick-ass stuff. You knew what you wanted. And even if it was based on your reality at some point, you said, I want this in this. And it would spur five pages of action yeah. or melodrama. That's that when, when somebody allows me to run with their, their emotions in a yeah. story, that's a, first, it's an honor. Second, oh God, I love that. I'm, I feel like a director in a film. But I feel you like that with other guys. Like you and Chuck Dixon, I thought worked really well together. And you and Dan Jerkins, I thought worked great. Like that, that well, thought I, run is sensational, you know? And I love Chuck's Punisher with you as well. I mean, you guys... There's a nice chemistry. I'd love to see you guys do more stuff. At, like, why, why did you never do more work with Chuck? Because you, you were That's such a good question. I don't know. I yeah. don't know. I'd like to get in touch with him and, and find out because loved every second of that Punisher stuff. But yeah. again, it was a little bit self-fulfilling in that it was such a, an important time in that character's development. Yeah. It became, yeah. That became a gigantic character after we, run, we yeah. went through that. Uh, listen, the Black Panther had the same kind of feeling. Yeah. When I worked with Reggie Hudlin on that, after that, there was talk about a film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, listen, you do whatever you want. As long as you put a middle-aged, short Italian guy from New York in the scene somewhere. <laughs> and they didn't do it. They didn't do it. I couldn't. <laughs> hey, listen, Matthew Vaughn said I didn't look authentic enough. I was the only New Yorker on the whole effing scene. Uh, the, whole, the whole of that film, I was the only real New Yorker in that movie. <laughs> it's, it's funny, though, like, uh, that little period, you know, like, Everybody has their gang in comics, you know, like you, you've been around the industry for a good few years, you know, that particular period, who were you hanging out with? Like the guys you're on the phones every day and just getting pep talks from, or you're giving them pep talks, or you're bitching about, you know, who you're working with and everything, you know, who, who was that sort of late eighties, early nineties gang for you? Oh boy. I honestly did not socialize much with the people in the, in the, the, the industry. Even, even conventions, conventions and things, you know. Conventions was, it was they were occasional. Yeah I, I guess, got, yeah, I got to be friends with guys playing softball. We would play softball and we'd go out for a couple of beers afterwards. But I had my own life on the side, which is another right. part and parcel to that anger that people had towards me that I felt I was greater than them because I didn't associate with them. Yeah, I yeah. did. It also led to some problems because I was supposed to be able to meet any woman and hand it to all these other people in the industry. They wanted me to, they wanted me to be a pimp. <laughs> Not quite those words, but. I didn't associate socially as much as I could have. Yeah. And I didn't think twice about it. I grew up with a bunch of people that are still my brothers. Yeah. And I, I that, those are the people that I uh, socialize with. However, I did eventually come to a point where conventions made close friends. Yeah. And I still have those. And R Ralph Matthew, did you hang out with Ralph at all? Yeah. I, did. I think Ralph is one of the greatest guys in the industry who, you know, editorial sometimes isn't as upfront as you know writers and artists and everything but he's the common thread that runs through all the best years at marvel isn't he i mean Ralph, sure. he was there from 1976 or something crazy daredevil, be daredevil became a brilliant success under his tutelage yeah absolutely true his reign when he asked me to do this this and this 
Yeah. And I got to work with great people. It's true. Very true. And I think it's because he didn't give a damn. Yeah. His family was successful in business separate yeah. from comics, but he loved comics. Yes. He, he didn't care. Oh, if I get fired, so what? Screw you. I'll go <laughs> run my father's business. But he and I got along famously, and he and my mother got along famously while they were in the office at the same time. And uh, I tell you, there's guineas. They know, they know how to talk to each other. I know. Something I, about I, Sicily. I, something about Sicily. I don't oh, know what is it is. He, is he not Northern Italian? Is he Southern Italian? Is he? I, Sicilian? We always th- he he, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have the edge of a Sicilian, but <laughs> part, he was partly Sicilian. My mother says anybody who's partly Sicilian is Sicilian. <laughs> Do you know it's funny? I remember R- Ralph used to come in a little later than everybody else, and he'd always go and catch his bus early back to Jersey. That's true. And, I used to say, does nobody give you a hard time for this? And he was so, you know, I, I loved sitting with Ralph. And Ralph would always say to me, yeah, but who does the best books? And he, he was right, you know, so nobody messed with him. You know? He also said he would take the work home with him and he would work late. Yeah. The, the success was what it was. Yeah. You can't argue with success. The book sold well. And that's ultimately what was his scrutiny. And you can't argue with success. Yeah, yeah. No, I love him. Uh, do you know, I need to give him a call, actually. I haven't spoken to him for a while. Are you, are you seen him? Really? call? I'd love to speak to him. I, there's yeah. a lot of people I'd like to catch up on yeah. uh, and that I haven't spoken to in quite a while. Absolutely true. Bob Layton is one of them. When I was in Dubai, yeah. the gentleman that ran the convention is got, has got to be close friends with uh, Layton. Right. And we sent him a video of the two of us standing there when I first arrived and Layton sent back some nasty age thing comment about him, about me looking good for an old man. You know, that kind of <laughs> shit. Do you know, I was going to ask you about that actually because... Like you obviously, you know, you're in crazy good shape and everything, you know, like, but it doesn't come easy. I mean, you're up early in the morning, aren't you? It's like, I mean, I remember we've obviously hung out a lot. And when I'm crawling in with a hangover at like 9 a.m., you've done like three hours in the gym and, and, and you're not even kidding, you know? And then when we have breakfast, you're having like egg white omelette and all that kind of stuff, you know? So, and it's funny because I spoke to Rob Liefeld. I mean, Rob's in good shape. But I said to Rob, you know, what's your routine? And he's like, hey, man, I do an hour on the bike every day, you know, but but you're you're heavily lifting weights from like 4 a.m. or something, aren't you? So t- I, I, tell I, me I, your routine. I'm curious what your day, what your I day is. Up, I get up at 5, get to the yeah. gym at 6.30. I give myself some time to wake up completely. I have a trainer. Yeah. And uh, I do everything. I do four days, four days a week of lifting and three other days of cardio. Yeah. Uh, there's the, it's the one thing that's beneficial to the world is in with vanity is that you can take it and use it to make you healthy. Yes. If, if I thought I was going to be a good looking guy because I worked out now, my body is in decent condition. doesn't make my nose any smaller. (laughs) I I exaggerate to clarify, but there is a certain amount of vanity in it. I don't want to be an older man. My father told me when we, when we were younger, he was always struggling with weight. He said, don't be like me, do something about it. Now, I have a beautiful wife named Kathy, who was a bodybuilder as a young woman, mm. and she taught me many things, and I yeah. still follow that. Uh, now it's part of my regimen. I have yeah. to do something before I work. I have to get some exercise. It sets my mind up, and uh, I- I'm proud that I'm, I'm 66, and I feel like I'm 26. That's crazy. It's crazy. But did that come with Kathy then? Did the exercise come with Kathy? The, the weightlifting did come with Kathy. I, I was always athletic before that. Yeah. I was athletic in a, in a, a madcap way, not enough of a strict discipline. Right. Then meeting my beautiful wife and she says, you got to, you know, you're in decent shape, but you could use this, this, and this. <laughs> and I, I had the money to hire a trainer. It was my yeah. gift to myself for the year. And she oversaw it. And she knew things I never knew. What year was this? Uh, I met her in 1994 at San Diego Comic-Con. Do you know what's so fascinating about that? Is that roughly coincides with the that elevation in your work as well? You know, like... I can argue with that. There's some, happiness, there, happiness does it. I, I'm so fascinated by the idea. But well, obviously, you know, everybody who works in comics wants to do it as long as possible, you know. But I think physical fitness definitely does something to you creatively as well isn't it you know like if you're lazy and you're tired and everything you're not doing your best work aren't you like Greg Capullo is a great example I think Capullo I remember Capullo being a kind of skinny Italian guy you know years ago and then he became this a pumped up guy and he's what something happened with his work he just jumped didn't he and he became a he was always a good artist but he became a superstar we were gonna we were gonna uh sell tickets to an an arm wrestling contest (laughs) to, to raise money for a charity (laughs) <laughs> and, and I was pulling the Muhammad Ali stuff. 
You don't have a chance. You're nothing but a bald headed <laughs> And he'd come back and you're just a pencil neck geek. And we had a great time, but we should have followed through on it. He's a great guy and a great artist. And you're right. Physical fitness does lend itself towards success. Yeah. If you really take care of yourself. Listen, smoking and drinking is not going to help. But uh, the exercise thing, like I said, it's the one thing vanity does right. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you know who's the best arm wrestler in comics, by the way? This will surprise you. Oh, who's that? Marvel managing editor, David Bogart. You know, he used to no, he used to lift weights competitively. Like he he would travel the world lifting weights. He's he's got arms like steel bars. You would never believe it because he always wears baggy tops. Yeah, yeah. Bogart is strong as an ox. I made $250 at a Bogart one night at San Diego Comic Con. There was, I was, for some reason, I was talking to a bunch of Marines who were all in the Hyatt Hotel. And uh, I was saying, some guy was saying he was great at arm wrestling. And I was like, I'm going to bet you a hundred bucks my friend can beat you, right? And David, David's pretty small. He's like 5'5 five, five or something, you know? And this guy was like, I'll, I'll destroy him. And David just put him down. It was fantastic. And this other guy came out and I ended up like betting quite a lot of money and I won 250 bucks. But da David was like, he was tired by the end of the night. You know? <laughs> Never knew that. Never knew that. That's great. That's a fantastic story. Oh, my God. But you know what's great about your longevity as well? Because from a business point of view, like when your contract's coming up, everybody gets nervous, you know, because you're kind of, at Mar I remember when I was at Marvel, it's like JFK leaving Camelot or something. Like <laughs> as your contract comes to an end, everybody's like, we need to, how do we get Johnny? Make sure Johnny stays and everything, you know? And that's quite a nice position to be in after decades in a company, isn't it? That they still want enough, to keep you. Interestingly enough, it's still that good feeling, but everything was tempered because of COVID. Yeah, uh, it took the, the industry took a dive. Now things have returned. Yeah, but it's it was tempered, so the contracts were adjusted according to yeah what happened with COVID. Yeah, and you got to be a realist. You have to still work hard. It's not easy. Yeah. and uh, the contracts were tempered, and uh, you know there's other ways to make up for it. But ultimately, you got to keep the sales there. And if yes. you don't listen, we talked about it before. The competitive nature of, yeah. uh, is there because if you don't do it right continually, yeah, yeah. you're not going to get paid. You're not going to get more work. Sorry, yes. it's cut and dried. I'm so one of the things that's so fascinating about a guy who's done it. I mean, I've done it for over thirty years now. But you, you know, you've done it fifteen years longer, twenty years longer almost. You must see the different personalities that's come into comics over decades the different trends within the industry itself, within the individual companies. What do you think of the big changes? Like, how, how different is a comic pro of 2022 to a guy from 1979, you know, when you're just in the office with your pages and everything? You know, do, does, it, does it feel the same or, or do the guys change over the years, do you think? No, there's a difference because, like I said, I, I met a lot of my father's contemporaries. Yeah. And then the guys that I came into the industry at the same time as, there is a different mindset because now technology allows a lot yeah. Uh, of, an, of assistance with some young people yeah. and some young artists. I don't say that that's a crutch, Yeah, but it is an assist. Uh, back in the day, it was hammer and chisel on the concrete, yeah. uh, just to coin a phrase. And I'm still just pencil and paper, and er mostly eraser, but pencil, eraser, and paper. Yeah, I can't use a computer laptop. However, the difference was there was a more of a, an innocence and less of an ego back in the old, older old school guys yeah put put the food on the table now there is an uh, a glow of adulation that comes because of the, the combining of film hollywood yes. and comics mm -hmm. and people are getting their just desserts and also grinning and and uh bragging about it there yeah. is more of a puffed up chest in the industry now than it ever was and you can't argue with it. as long as you're successful you can't Get on you with success. Was that not always the case? I mean, just from an outsider looking in as a kid, you know, I always felt guys like Adams and John Byrne and everybody had a kind of swagger, didn't they? You know, like, I mean, the they egos must have been the there. Can't argue with the sales. Yeah. But the ego must have always been in a creative personality, you know, all, all the way back. But before they became comic book artists, they were yeah. uh, brilliant talents before then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there were egos. I don't think that was the overwhelming feel of the industry mm -hmm. but there were those that were had their egos and listen yeah. brilliant artists have egos yeah it's more so now than it was then i really i fully believe that i guess what i never really thought of as a great point is you know that twitter for example you know means that you've got 500,000 media every day telling you you're amazing you know 
Whereas in the past, you maybe saw letters when you popped into the Marvel office, if you were lucky, you know, but generally you just got on with your job. So maybe now there's a convention every weekend, lines of people queuing up to get your their book signed. Maybe that does something to people's personalities a little. It does. But there's also, see, with me, I'm a realist because I have as many detractors as I have uh, uh, fans. <laughs> and I'll get things that, I'll get comments you suck. You never were good. You're only here on your father's tail. <laughs> Even now, this is. <laughs> and I'd say, I'd say, Mom, you can't talk to your son. Like that. <laughs> uh, the truth is, in social media, you hear the good and the bad. Yeah. And it does temper you and it keeps your feet on the ground. Well, that's, that's what I feel. I think it keeps you on your toes a little, doesn't it? You know, because you have true. people just going for you all the time. Listen, I, get people come to, I get people come to me at a table at a convention and say, I don't like your stuff, but would you sign my book for my son? <laughs> <laughs> never forget that. I'll never forget that. But the, the idea of like, um, you know, Twitter in the 70s or the 80s would have been crazy, wouldn't it? You know, oh like, my God, could you imagine? Yeah. Could you imagine? So the, it's, it's crazy now. Uh, aside from the <laughs> politics, yeah. What it does is allow your stuff to be immediate all over the yeah. world. Yeah. And there's an advantage to that and a disadvantage to that. If you're not tempered, if you're not careful, yeah, your head will get above <laughs> your talent and you got to be really careful. But it is odd, isn't it? Because I mean, I get into comics because I love them, right? And I love to meet other people who are into comics and I still do. I there's nothing I love more than bumping into some guy who I find out as a comic book fan and we'll, we'll both geek out over the same artists and all this kind of stuff. But there's, there's a weird thing with Twitter, isn't there, where there is that weird negativity as well, where people go on to hate as well. You know, it's like, I, I don't have enough hours in my day to hate something physically online, like go on and talk about it, you know. And and I, I do wonder, you know, I guess it's like the Western culture in general turns in on itself sometimes and starts to pull apart the culture itself, you know. I wonder if, do you think that's happening in comics a little bit? I do. Too? I do. You can't, it can't. Social media has such a strong grip, a grip on so many businesses. Yeah, and a visual and a visual medium, uh, it, it, it's a natural yeah. reaction. It's also dangerous. Yeah, we, it just, it's obvious. You have to be careful. And I do get as much as many detractors as I get supporters. Yeah, and all you have to do is remember, nobody's perfect. I, yeah. the best of anybody, the best athlete still has detractors. Yeah. LeBron James might be the best athlete on the planet, and yet he has detractors because, yeah. well, he opens his mouth too much. But aside from that, he doesn't. <laughs> he's not perfect. Yeah. Athletes aren't perfect. Artists aren't perfect. Everybody has opinions. Social media allows that. And uh, it's good because it, in, it, it inspires me to be better. Every yeah. time I hear somebody make fun of my work, it makes me, instead of getting upset with it, yeah. and this is where my, my skin has gotten thicker as I've gotten older, mm -hmm. it makes me, it inspires me to get better. And I still yeah. have room for improvement. God, like I said, I'll be 200. I might be really good when I'm 200. <laughs> But it's interesting, you, you told me you were just back from Dubai, we were talking the other day, and, and there's something interesting about that, isn't there, where it's such a forward-feeling vibe in Dubai, isn't it? Like I, I said to my wife when we were there a few months ago, I said, there's no building here that is older than Justin Bieber, which is such a weird <laughs> feeling, isn't it? When you're in the place, like, everything is new. Okay. And, and, it's and, brilliant. And, here's a, and the, 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 the fun part was we get off the plane, we're all yeah. exhausted because we were coming from Luca. Yeah. And in the, in the cab, the, the van, my son, Joey, my wife, yeah. Kathy, and I are craning our necks to look at the buildings like, yeah. like tourists from Kansas yeah. in a big city. You'd... <laughs> and it, it's incredible. And the yes. driver was, oh, do you like that? Is that that's fantastic. Uh, uh, and would describe these buildings to us. It was a visual, a visual vacation. Yeah. But it was work. And we loved every second of it. I gotta say, I'm starting to get contacted by my wife. We have some business we gotta take care of. Oh, listen, I'll I'll give you a couple of last questions then. You know, I'll okay. just say here's a we didn't even get to talk about kick ass, but there's so much of that stuff online. People can can see us talking about it all the time, you know. And what a fun experience it was doing a comic becomes a movie, all this kind of stuff. So I'll jump right to it. Here's a big question, right? Your mom and dad's huge influence in your life. They were doing what you were doing a generation before. What do you think you've done creatively? that has made them most proud? Wow. If I, if I, my father's opinions of my work, because of the many different characters I worked on, uh, 
was out of, out of the storytelling and he says I was a better cartoonist than him. I don't know how true that is. Mm -hmm. He's the brilliant artist. And speaking of LeBron James, he's LeBron James on the water boy. <laughs> if I had to pick the one thing that they're most proud of, it's probably working on Spider-Man. Right. Yeah. That's really me because it, it, it followed through with what he was doing and I yeah. learned a lot, a lot of it from him. Did he ever say that to you? Did he, did he, did he talk to you about it? Cause it's hard. I mean, my dad was the same. That generation yeah, of men. Those words never came out that I love that you're doing Spider-Man. He would say, I love that you're doing this book and I love that you what you're doing. But my mother told me that he was proud that we were doing Spider-Man together. And we did several issues together. I, it, it was it was that heartfelt camaraderie, that family yeah. thing that was involved. Loved every minute of it. And I would bring him as, as a, a full-blown adult in the industry. Yeah. I'd go over there on Sunday and I'd sponge off food and I'd yeah. bring it, you know, I'd bring my work and I would sit there and listen to my father look at the pages of a previously yeah. fin of, of, of a finished issue. Yeah. And he would say this, this, and this. I loved it. And but you know what you could have done? And that little bit of advice would expand into something better. Yes. That's the way he was. And that was that's him as an art director. I mean, that's that was his job at Marvel too. So he had to Correct. Had that in him, didn't Correct. They? That's quite magical though. That's a, that's a nice that's a nice thing, isn't it? Yeah. It was. And it's great. It, there's advantages and disadvantages to having a brilliant Let me tell you something. He did a painting for the for the women's army corps when he was in the yeah. military. Yeah. He did a painting at age 19. Yeah. That is now in the Smithsonian Institution. I didn't know I can't that. do that now. That's how brilliant this man was. That's he amazing. became a cartoonist to pay the bills, the Depression yeah. era. The man is one of the most brilliant artists you will ever meet. And he never talked about it. No big deal to him. Our generation of dads don't say I love you the way that our generation of dads say I love you to the children. But you knew right. they loved you, you know. But it's nice It's nice that your mum was able to kind of pass that information back to you, though, as well. That he was it was. Proud. It's great. Yeah. It was. But I also witnessed it because I would bring it, the, the work to him and we would talk about it. And we, yeah. we, we would get, there was a camaraderie. And then we would, we would have a catch. We'd throw the ball around. Yeah. Catch and mitt. And we talk about the business. We talk about the industry. Yeah. And he would tell me what he liked and what he didn't like without telling me what he liked and didn't like that I did unless yeah. I brought the work to him. Again, sure. he never volunteered any criticism, but he would criticize when he looked at the work that I would bring to him. And it was always constructive. It was brilliant. The man knew what he was doing. You always took it well then? It was always good? Yeah. Yeah, yes and no. Yeah. But I would never say, Dad, I can't believe you're saying something like that to me. Right. I'd go home and i yeah. say, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing and before we go then your mount rushmore give me your four presidents of comics who are the artists who are your your guys on mount rushmore oh kirby Bissema, ramita and uh hubert do you know i can't argue with that that's brilliant alex toth should have a little fifth head on there but you're you right. know yeah yeah oh, yeah you can't argue with that you're right that's a brilliant brilliant goal so six <laughs> Listen, you, you'll be up there too when you're when you're 205 we'll get you up on there as well you know? someday and you're going to be right next to me telling me what you like and what you don't like we'll have a beer together listen johnny it's brilliant seeing you i can't wait to we get a beer again you know when you make another kick-ass really film whatever the hell you know kathy is screaming from the other room to, for me to shut up and she says she's sending her love uh send my effing love to mark <laughs> 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 well listen we're going to come to the states at some point in the next few months we'll hopefully see you then we all will. the best we'll you when you come here and you'll see us when we get there i miss you a lot buddy talk to you soon you too see you soon johnny bye don't forget that's magic order american jesus and prodigy out in november coming in january nemesis reloaded with art by jorge jimenez in december for only 199 nightclub by me and juan and ramirez it's going to be brilliant 199 can you believe it